Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, I'm the lead Apple technician at RMIT University in Melbourne, and I'm part of a team that looks after about 3,000 odd Macs across the campus. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from Duncan's presentation. Um, after that fantastic lunch, less caffeine, probably more of a food coma, not quite as much tech. Um, I'm going to be looking at Apple IDs and how they work in enterprise or institutional environments. And the traditional model of managing devices, the golden triangle, and how this has changed to embrace the new directions iOS and Mac OS X are heading, and how Apple IDs integrate into that model. And then what does this mean for us, the Mac admins? Um, how do we use this? When should we use it? Um, and when maybe we shouldn't use it? Now, this isn't an analysis of how we're doing things at RMIT. Uh, my colleague Tanya and I presented that last year. This is more reading of the tea leaves, trying to understand the changing environment. There's lots of ambiguous information out there and a lot of opinion. Um, and if you see anything in here that is incorrect or out of date, let me know. Um, I might also add that these views are my own and they don't re necessarily represent those of my employer. So let's start with Apple IDs. Um, I imagine everybody here has one, um, if not more than one. Uh, some people have many of them. What is an Apple ID? Um, probably the best place to start is Apple's support page. And we can see this statement that Apple give. It's a fairly simplistic idea. Um, we know there's a lot more to them than that. If you want to get more simple, it's an identity. It's how we let Apple know who we are when we're interacting with their systems. And they provide several lists of these systems and services that we can use Apple IDs for. And most of them are out of date as new systems come on board, such as Apple Music. That's gone way ahead. Um, and other systems um, become end of production. You've got to use a valid email address for an Apple ID. Um, in the old days of the developer connection, you could use a text username, but now they require a valid email address. And there's strict password requirements. When you set up, you've got to provide answers to three security questions, and they can be removed if you enable two-step authentication, but we'll get to more about that later. There's four main kinds of Apple IDs. There's probably a lot more than this, but I'm going to focus on these ones because they're the primary ones that we're going to interact with in, um, in our roles. So Apple IDs are a means of identification. It makes sense that the primary Apple ID is a personal Apple ID. It in, identifies an individual to Apple, and they recommend that you avoid having multiple Apple IDs. This is in their eyes, you're still the same person regardless of the email address that you're using. There's a couple of exceptions to this, but Apple are quite strong in their view that the best experience you're going to have is using a single Apple ID. Um, the terms and conditions state that you have to be over 13, um, and you use this Apple ID to accept VPP apps from your institution. That's going to be a better experience than having your personal Apple ID and your work Apple ID in Apple's eyes, you're the same person. And it's the same for the developer program. Uh, some companies recommend that you use a company Apple ID when you sign on to the enterprise developer program. Apple doesn't suggest this. There's no technical difference between an institutional Apple ID and a personal Apple ID. The institutional Apple ID is a personal account, an Apple ID that's been created by an organisation to access services. Things like push notifications, um, the App Store and the Mac App Store when you're using shared devices. So they've got different licensing conditions. Uh, in the terms and conditions for the Mac App Store, really the only reference to this is if you're an individual, you can install anything that you've purchased on any device that you have control over. An organisation, one app, one device. It's a good idea to ensure that multiple people have access to this Apple ID. If someone goes on holidays or leaves the organisation, especially if you've got two-step authentication, make sure other people can get into it. There's the non-consumer Apple ID, and that's used to administer commercial agreements, um, VPP, DEP, AppleCare and Enterprise. Can't be used with the App Store. 
and must have a commercial email address. This is the situation where Apple say, we care about what the email address is. It needs to be the same email address for the organisation that's applying for it. And there are other restrictions on these depending on the program that you're applying for. But it's a, this is a very specific ID that's used for a very specific thing. As I said before, you need to be 13 and over to have an Apple ID. There's a couple of ways around this. Um, recently, Apple have released family sharing where six family members can link their Apple IDs and share purchases. Under 13s can have an Apple ID if it's part of this linked family sharing program. The parent can manage their account, they can take control of purchasing, restrictions and password resets. Now in Australia, this is the method that Apple recommend for providing Apple IDs for 13 and under. Some schools are using different ways of doing that where they bulk create Apple IDs using an Apple script uh, or they get the parents to create an Apple ID with a student's email address. This is not supported by Apple. In the States, they've released the Apple ID for students program. Um, it's made the life of a K-12 iPad admin in schools a lot easier because the schools can enrol in the program. They then create a CSV which has got the parent's email, the student's email and their date of birth. The parents get sent terms and conditions, they agree to that and then the Apple ID is created. The teachers have password reset to the Apple ID which is great in environments where the kids may forget their password and need access to it. Might also be useful to have Apple IDs for academics or C-level executives where we can have the same sort of ability to sort things out. When the student reaches 13, that Apple ID is automatically transferred to becoming a personal Apple ID. So any of the restrictions or anything like that that apply are no longer there and then it reverts to being the same kind of Apple ID we spoke about earlier. Two-step verification came out. If you're not using this, set it up now. Um, there's been a lot of press about Apple IDs being hacked or people using bad passwords. Um, this requires you to enter a temporary passcode from a trusted device whenever you access a service or you're making changes to your Apple ID. If you're purchasing from a new device, uh, logging into web services. They recommend you register multiple devices, so your partner, parents, somebody else that you know and trust because you, know, you may lose your phone, the battery may be dead on your phone and you need to access something and you've got no way of getting that temporary passcode. Um, yesterday, Apple announced some changes in iOS 9 and El Capitan. Um, the language is a little bit ambiguous at this stage. It's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Six-digit passcodes. Um, it sounds like the recovery key might be going away. Rather than needing the recovery key if you forget the password, it sounds like there might be a consultation with Apple to determine who you are and whether they're going to release that Apple ID. So that's going to be really interesting to look at and see where that goes. So what does this mean for the enterprise? Um, a lot of it looks to be very much consumer-based. Um, so there's challenges to how we integrate this into the organisation. Um, VPP is the big one. That's been in Australia for a while. Um, the idea is that users are free to use their personal Apple ID for apps provided by their institution or organisation. It's 50% off for education. So um, that's a great incentive to use that program. There's two kinds of VPP. There's managed distribution and redemption codes. Redemption codes are a consumable. That's something you give to the user and you don't get back. There's a cost versus benefit analysis that you've got to think about when you decide whether you want to go manage distribution or redemption codes. If you're really just going to be giving away a couple of apps that are worth a couple of dollars, it might be easier just to use redemption codes rather than thinking about the total cost of ownership of managing those redemption codes and bringing them back. There's nothing to say that you can't use both systems. Another thing to be mindful of is app adoption on new machines. If you're giving someone a new machine out of the box, do you want to prevent them from adopting the iLife and iWork apps that are on that device and try and manage that through VPP? Or do you just want to let them have the apps? You, know, you can sometimes run into issues where that person may leave the organisation, that device needs to get moved on to somebody else. But maybe 
you look at just using redemption codes for that scenario uh, rather than trying to administer the overhead of managing yet more redemption codes. Apple doesn't reveal the specific Apple ID that the user redeems VPP codes against. So this is also something that a, a lot of procurement and uh, in institutions struggle with. Apple knows who's redeemed the code and any subsequent codes, they're going to put them to the same Apple ID, but that Apple ID is a private piece of information between them and the consumer uh, and they're not going to reveal that information to you as to what the Apple ID was. The user can use any Apple ID they want to redeem those codes. A couple of tips with Apple IDs. If you're going to be bulk creating Apple IDs, whether it's students or users creating them on site, or whether it's people going and creating them at the start of semester at home using perhaps email addresses from the same domain, speak to your Apple SEs and get the um, get your domain and your IP whitelisted. If you get both of them done, that way it doesn't really matter where you may trip up. And they can get your domain whitelisted for 30 days. So for that period, it doesn't matter how many Apple IDs are created. It's not going to pop up on Apple security systems and get you blocked. Email addresses. Um, I've had scenarios where I've tried to move my personal Apple ID onto a different email address because I'm, you know, moving to a different domain, I'm not using the ISP I was using before. And then I find that the email address I'm wanting to use already has an Apple ID. Um, it may have been that I used that in the interaction with Apple Retail, booking for a Genius Bar appointment. They've deemed for a long time any email address you use with Apple becomes an Apple ID, even if you haven't created a password or signed in with it. Um, a way of dealing with that is go to iforgot.apple.com, put in that email address, and it'll send you a password reset, um, even if there wasn't a password. If it doesn't ask you to answer the security questions, it's because there never were security questions. Rather than then requesting that they delete that Apple ID, which if you speak to Apple support, they can do, I've found sometimes that doesn't free up the email address for some time to be used again. So the process here is to change it to a different email address for a burner account, uh, something with Hotmail or Gmail, that then frees up the email address that you want to use that you can then transfer to your other Apple ID. It's a fairly lengthy process, but um, sometimes in the long run, it's a bit easier to be using the email address that you want. Changing country, that used to be difficult. Apple have made it a lot easier now. You can quite easily log in to um, the Apple ID management console and select a new country, but there's a couple of gimmies you can't have any store credit. That's to prevent people buying app store credit in one country and then looking at exchange rates and the cost of apps, transferring to another country and buying apps or television shows. You also can't have any valid season passes on the Apple TV um, because they need to be finished in the country that they're purchased. When you move to a different country, it may be that some apps and some content isn't available if that's not available in the country you're moving to, then it's not going to be um, present when you move there. You can move backwards and forwards as many times as you want. You can also use Apple IDs for file sharing and screen sharing. If you associate an Apple ID with a user account, you can then log into file sharing or screen sharing for that user with the Apple ID. But as Charles mentioned yesterday, this also happened in Yosemite. Apple allowed you to federate your Apple ID with your local account much the same way that you may federate Active Directory and have a mobile account. Now, that may seem like a good idea, and I certainly thought that was interesting when it came out, but if you go on the developer forum and search for a post called run away, run away, <laughs> there's a cautionary tale there about what can happen uh, was just recently when El Capitan came out after WWDC, a lot of users were finding out if they logged into the developer portal, they were told that their password had expired and they needed to change it. Now, this user managed to get their password completely out of sync to what 1Password thought it was, what their keychain thought it was, what Apple thought it was, and what their workstation thought it was. And they managed to lock themselves out of everything. And it kind of made keychain sync issues look like a walk in the park. So 
that may not quite be ready for production yet, so um, I wouldn't be using it until it's gone a little bit further. Um, here's a bunch of links to some of the things I've been speaking about. Um, other things like downloading Mac App Store packages that aren't tied to a particular Apple ID that can be a good way of pushing them out to shared machines. Um, these slides are going to be shared, um, so you can go and visit those links. Let's move on to the golden triangle. Um, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with this con concept. Um, how many people are using golden triangle at the moment in their institution? We've got a couple of people there. Um, I wish I had a slide of the jewellery that John was showing yesterday, but I'm going to have to use this slightly less precious triangle. So... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> thank you, Tony. Um, so you start with your organisation's directory service. We've got Active Directory here. Um, you've got your Mac OS X server running Open Directory, which you bind to it. That gives Open Directory access to the users and groups that are in Active Directory. Then you bind your workstations to Active Directory and Open Directory. You can apply MCX or managed preferences for all of the things you want to control to that workstation. Depending on who's logging in, what the machine is, there's a lot of flexibility about what you can do to the machine. It gives you a lot of control over how the machines are set up, what can be done to them, and what can't be done to them after setup. It's a very invasive um, process, and it's not very straightforward to revoke. I worked at one stage in an organisation where we bound BYOD to Golden Triangle. That was very interesting when people tried to leave, especially if nobody told the IT department that they'd left and then they'd gone overseas. Um, it's good for places where you want to have total control over what happens on the machine. MCX has been deprecated since 10.8. Um, I don't like using things that have been deprecated, even if they still work, because like Duncan mentioned before, things can just go away without any notice. Um, so MCX has been replaced with configuration profile. And workgroup manager's gone, but we've got profile manager. Um, friends don't let friends use profile manager. Um, profile manager's great in small organisations. Apple themselves say it does not scale well. There are lots of other solutions out there. There's also some interesting things happening with open source MDM. Um, the X server's gone. Um, there are Mac Minis. There's a lot of arguments as to whether Mac Minis are enterprise grade or not. Um, lots of arguments. It's also not ideal for mobile devices. So, you know, Golden Triangle doesn't really help with devices that are not always at the institution or iPads um, or iPhones. Um, Apple have some interesting comments to make about binding to AD. We've got Apple's white paper, best practices for integrating OS X with Active Directory. It goes through all the configuration. There's a lot that you can do. You can have a lot of control over how you bind to AD and what this does. But then they make statements like this, which is in Apple's inimitable ambiguity saying, don't bind to AD. <laughs> um, so what should we do with these devices if we're not binding to AD? So the new triangle has the user in the center. And with this triangle, each item in the diagram has a relationship with each other. And it's important to understand exactly what that relationship is and how they link. And also important to understand how they don't link, where there isn't a relationship. So the user has a relationship with their device or their devices. And you'll notice that there's iOS in there this time. So that relationship is their passcode or their password to their local user account. The organisation has a relationship with the user. LDAP, Kerberos, identity management, that's a relationship with the user, not with the device. What's the relationship the organisation has with the device? Well, that's MDM. That's how the organisation can send changes, configuration to the device. So we've got Apple, and the user's got a relationship with Apple, which is the Apple ID. That's not between the user and the organisation. That's between the user and Apple. 
the organisation has VPP, which is how they get access to provide services for the user's Apple ID. They've also got DEP that they use with Apple. Now, Apple also has a relationship with the device, which is device enrolment program and the push notification service. Triangle probably isn't the best way of describing it, but it shows the difference between the old way of doing it and the new way of doing it. So the important thing is the user is at the centre. It empowers the user. Rather than the organisation being in total control over how this works, it's the user that dictates a lot of this. It's providing services for the user. Um, rather than trying to tie all of your management systems into one system, we embrace the fact that we're going to use many different systems to provide different services and it allows us to tailor our services to our particular needs makes it a lot easier to change because there aren't as many dependencies. And this is the simplicity that Charles spoke about yesterday. The diagram did look complex, but the model is a lot simpler to integrate. It's a big change for organisations to deal with when they're used to having total control. But the world is different, and it's not just Apple that know this. With Windows 10, Microsoft are moving away from recommending full AD binding for devices that they say are infrequently on the domain, which sounds a little bit different to what Apple said. And they state, because the world is different. So Microsoft aren't quite going to the level that Apple is, but they're kind of heading in the same path. So what does this mean for us? So we've looked at the model that Apple would like us to use for managing devices and we've looked at Apple IDs, but how do we get these concepts, which are, look great in a diagram, but how do we actually get this to work in our environments? These models work great in one-to-one -one deployments, uh, where you've got, this device is only used by this person. Great in environments where you don't have multiple users on devices. It also allows BYOD to be integrated into your organisation. You can set minimum configuration standards that people have to adhere to before they can get all of the other services that you're offering. It also works really well with iOS because this is how Apple have designed it. And if you try something other than this with iOS, it's probably going to hurt. Um, sharing an iPad is a bit like sharing a toothbrush. But this model doesn't work in all environments. Um, labs, for example, um, you really want to have it bound to AD, so you can say who's able to log into it, who isn't able to look into it, log into it. But rather than refusing to embrace it, because there are edge cases and we can find, oh, well, we're not going to use that because it doesn't work over here and this part over here doesn't work, it's really a horses for courses approach. And rather than deciding on the model of how we're going to support devices, this is how we're going to structure things and then everything we have in the organisation is going to fit into that model. Um, we need to assess the merits of what the requirements are for this device, what's the particular use case for this device, so which model is going to suit it. We've also got to be prepared to change because something different may be required or Apple is going to release something shiny and new that makes everything go away. Um, at RMIT, we've taken the approach of binding and AD logins to our lab machines that are always on campus. It's iMacs and Mac Pros. They're always on the network, and we need anybody to be able to log into them. We also image those machines when we refresh them every year. So maybe imaging isn't dead, but it's not very healthy at the moment. Our staff laptops, we use local accounts, and we've got a custom Kerberos app. So when they want to access network shares, printing, authenticate to anything the organisation's doing, if they click on the application, they put in their credentials, they get a Kerberos ticket. We found the Mac App Store still a little bit challenging to deal with. Um, some things VPP is good for, some things it's not. Um, Apple seem to be listening. So what's the future? Um, WWDC, we saw changes with device enrolment program and VPP. So they've realised that their current model doesn't really work for shared devices. So now you'll be able to get a managed um, license and you'll be able to apply that to a device without an Apple ID and then bring that back when you want to, when you want to use it again. Um, Apple IDs for students isn't available in Australia yet. Um, I think that would make a big difference to um, K-12. 
managing um, iPad programs. Um, MDM vendors like Jamf um, are coming up with new features and new ways of exploiting Apple systems. And then there's our own community of Mac admins that are creating some, some really awesome tools like the one John spoke about yesterday. Um, we've got to be flexible in how we look after our fleets, um, focusing on the solution or the solutions that we're going to provide to give the best possible experience for the users and the organisations. So I'm interested in hearing what you think the future is. What's some of the things that you've seen in your exploration and your travels that has changed the way you've managed devices? Um, how are you integrating Apple IDs into your organisation? Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to say? Yeah. So, authenticating against file views. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was about logging into file shares with an Apple ID. I've played around with it. Um, the documentation around it is ambiguous at best. Um, I stopped playing around with it when I read that post about the um, logging into the computer with the Apple ID because I thought, what could go horribly wrong here? It's interesting, but it's... Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was the same experience I had. Um, it didn't seem to be um, fully, fully formed yet, would probably be the way of describing. Has anybody else tried, tried doing that screen sharing with Apple IDs and file sharing with Apple IDs? Yeah, it's been yeah, yeah, it sounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any other? Issues with Apple IDs that uh, that people have come across. Um, that Apple ID issues of um, through those um, websites, the rumor websites. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be coming to Australia. Yeah. Um, and that's purely around the fact that with iOS nine, that you could um, deploy apps and stuff without an Apple ID. Yeah. So yeah. Kind of yeah. It, it's it's going to be interesting to see where there are challenges with that. Is I know some organisations the parents pay for the apps that are on the iPads, and so then the idea of that then migrating across. So that's going to, that's going to be interesting to see. I've, I've heard similar things, but I've also heard a lot of people begging for it. Yeah. I've also heard the experience from the admins in the States who are using it, and they've just said, this, is, this has changed our life. So yeah, that'll be interesting to keep an eye on. Um, another interesting point I found with Apple IDs, who here has an Apple ID that expires its password regularly? Who would like that not to happen? You just fixed it. Was it through um, developer support? Yeah, the, I've also got a link uh, on my Apple ID links. My understanding is it harks back to the older days where you used to be able to set a password expiry on Apple IDs if you were part of a developer program. When they took that feature away, they took away the console, but they didn't take away the setting on the back end. So if you had an expiry, you were stuck with an expiry. Lots of people had tried to get rid of it. No one seemed to know what was happening, what was causing it. Um, there's a link to a page where someone gives an AppleCare case number where they managed to successfully get that removed. And they've said, if you tell them this case number, they're going to read the case and know how to fix it. So there's another tip if you want to get password expiry. Um, sorry? Oh, yeah. GSX is another one with Apple IDs. Um, if you don't log in for a month, you get locked out of GSX. Um, if you go on leave, uh, you get locked out of GSX. That's potentially going to be changing soon. I know they're changing the way um, third-party applications access GSX. Um, it'd be nice for them to just embrace two-factor authentication to stop that happening. That broke a lot of stuff that happened in the US. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the reason why I don't have a lot of GSX uh, screen grabs on there. Um, I went on leave, my um, GSX ID got locked out and that's the administrator. So um, another slide I've got up here, um, is anyone familiar with using Slack? Um, <laughs> uh, John Kitzmiller, XJAMF and Caleb Coy have set up a Mac admin Slack channel. Uh, it's 
just recently has it hit 600 users yet? I think today it just hit 600 users. 643. If you go to macadmins.org, you can sign up. Um, you've got access to 600 of you know, the best minds in Mac Admin in the world. There's channels for all sorts of different things. There's a, um, there's a Jamf Nation channel. There's a Australia channel where there's um, a whole bunch of Australians in there. But that's a really good resource for uh, getting live support from the community. Um, there's a lot of traffic on it um, while we're asleep in America. Uh, you can get up in the morning, can you watch people, you know, hyperventilating because something's gone wrong with a server and people are just jumping in and help them fix it. Um, there's some amazing information there as well. Hi. What was the custom camera you mentioned? Uh, it's one we wrote ourselves. So it really just uses K in it. Um, and it's just providing a little GUI for the users through scripting. Um, I know a lot of organisations are doing it. It's something that Apple recommends, where you just have something that they can click on, put their username and password in, and they get their authentication. We're looking at ways of um, using that to mount network shares, um, focusing really on the user experience. What sort of things does a user want to access? What's a really easy way of them accessing it? How can we give them visual cues that they're connected rather than just hoping that it works? Um, so, you know, that, that's something that you can have a play around with. Any more questions? No. Thank you very much.